So my name is Tess and I'm a nurse practitioner. I'm part of the Diabetes Comprehensive Care Program and I specifically work um, with post-transplant patients, so people who've had kidney transplants, um, as well as in diabetes. So diabetes is my specialty. I've been in diabetes for a long time, like 25 years. Um, and so thank you for coming and thank you for inviting me to speak to you today on the topic of diabetes and specifically I'm going to talk about what's new in diabetes care and what's not so new. And feel free to ask questions as we go along, I don't mind being interrupted. So the things that I'll just review with you today um, and, uh, are what are the types of diabetes and there's some things that are new in terms of what types of diabetes are what the risk factors are for diabetes and how we can prevent diabetes. And then I'll talk a little bit about the new treatments in diabetes care and I'll end with the newest monitoring technology that's available to you. So the unfortunate thing that's not new is that diabetes is still an epidemic. And what does that mean worldwide? So this map is really just to illustrate how many people have diabetes. And this data is from the International Diabetes Federation from 2017. And I was just gonna highlight where that red star is. So you can see that at the bottom right. There's 425 million people in the world with diabetes. And they expect that number to go up by 48% in 2045. That's a lot of people. In Canada, there is about 3.4 million people living with diabetes and 5.7 million with prediabetes. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, more about what prediabetes is. So again, a lot of people just in Canada alone have diabetes. So something that's new so can the Canadian Diabetes Association sort of change their name and their logo and their color scheme to Diabetes Canada? So if you hear about Diabetes Canada, it's the same organization as the Canadian Diabetes Association. So you've, you'll see it now looking blue in color and it's called Diabetes Canada. And that is the website if you're um, if you have access to a computer where you can access resources for yourself or your family members regarding diabetes. And this is an example of what is available to you. And if you look at the tabs on the top, so under publications and newsletters, there's something called Diabetes Current. And you can sign up for this free e-newsletter so you get it electronically, again, if you have access to a computer. Um, just to stay connected and up to date on the latest news and research and medical breakthroughs. So that's just one example of resources that's available to you on the website. And there's things that you can also download and print out or even request as hard copy if you don't have a printer or access to a computer. This is just another example of a resource called Healthy Living and it's a calendar that they put out every year. And what's good about it is that it features recipes for each month that are Diabetes Canada approved, plus health tips from registered dietitians. So again, another resource that you can access through Diabetes Canada. Okay, so let's just go in a little bit of some pathophysiology and what is prediabetes. So has everybody heard of the term prediabetes? So it's something that in the past used to be referred to as borderline diabetes and I think that term is still being used which is really not correct. It's actually a condition and, and it means that your blood sugar isn't on the normal range but it's not quite the levels of diabetes. So it's a blood sugar, if you tested your fasting sugar and it falls between 6.1 and 6.9 that is not normal. It's not quite diabetes level, but it's called impaired fasting glucose, and that is pre-diabetes level. Or if, we, if you went for a special test where you took a drink of sugar 
and they measured your blood sugar two hours later and your blood sugar was between 7.8 and 11, that is not normal and that would be also pre-diabetes level. So not as high as diabetes, but it's pre-diabetes. And why is this important? 50% will go on to develop type 2 diabetes. And it's associated with heart disease as well as nerve damage. So it's important to identify and screen and do something about it. So there is, some, there is interventions for people who live with prediabetes to hopefully prevent it from going on to type 2 diabetes, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So diabetes itself, it is common. I just showed you the big map of the world and some numbers around uh, how many Canadians have it. One in 10 will have diabetes by 2020, they say. But the thing is, is that it is controllable and really it, it's good management depends on the person living with it and the family members that, who live with the person with diabetes. However, it is chronic, it is a lifelong condition, so it will not go away. And some of the good news is that it is preventable and you're in the stage where you're pre-diabetes and you can, before pre-diabetes, you can hopefully prevent it from actually developing. So lifestyle modifications, um, the scientist uh, showed it can reduce the risk by up to 60%. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means. So normal blood sugar control, just to review what actually happens in our body, how do we control our blood sugars? In people without diabetes, the pancreas, which is our, one of our organs, is where insulin comes from and that's what helps to control the sugar. It's released from the pancreas at the right time in the right amounts. And insulin in this diagram is represented by the keys. And this is your bloodstream and this is a cell. So the insulin helps the glucose or sugar and the, uh, which is represented by the G to enter the cells to be used for energy. So when you eat, the um, food that you eat turns into sugar, enters the bloodstream, and then needs to move into the cell to be used for energy. You don't want to have a lot of sugar in your blood, and that would keep it roughly between four and six, and that's the normal range of blood sugar. And this is what normally would happen if you didn't have diabetes. But when somebody has diabetes, there's not enough insulin or keys, and there isn't, and insulin isn't working properly, so it can't open the door to the cell. We call that insulin resistance. So the sugar stays in the bloodstream, resulting in a higher than normal blood sugar. And that would, in the certain levels, as I mentioned, in prediabetes, um, so fasting between 6.1 and 6.9 and in a, a postprandial blood sugar, so after eating up to 11. So in diabetes, when the levels go above 7 as a fasting or above 11.1 um, after eating, those are diabetes levels when you get up that high. And it results in no energy. So how do you think you would feel if the sugar is all in your blood and not in your cells, you'd feel pretty tired. And that's one of the signs of diabetes. So here are the warning signs. Well, what, how will you feel if this is happening to you? You're going to pee a lot. You're going to feel uh, thirsty. So you're going to have a dry mouth. You're going to feel thirsty. And it's going to make you go to the bathroom. Why? Because the body's trying to get rid of that extra sugar through the urine. And it's a vicious cycle. You lose a lot of fluid from the urinating makes you thirsty and have a dry mouth. And you're tired because you have no energy going into the cells, being made into the cells. And you can have initial weight loss at the beginning as well because you lose calories as the sugar is being peed out. So, yes? Uh, why do diabetic patients pee a lot? Sorry, say one more time. Why do diabetic patients or people pee a lot? Okay, so when the sugar's high, that's when it tends to happen. The body's trying to get rid of that extra sugar through the urine. And that's what makes one pee a lot as a symptom of diabetes. 
since insulin is from the pancreas, does it mean that diabetic people have bad pancreas? Is it related to pancreatic cancer? Is there a relationship? That's a very good question. So it's not directly related. So diabetes itself is not a type of cancer. But certainly, if the pancreas isn't functioning properly as a result of cancer, they may exhibit higher blood sugars if it's the insulin um, output is not is being affected by the cancer itself. But it's not directly associated with the type of diabetes we're talking about. So type two diabetes. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there are other causes for diabetes. One of which can be a problem with the pancreas itself, as in cancer. Okay, does that make sense? I'll talk a little bit more about the types of diabetes and actually what the mechanisms as to why it actually develops. And that's one of the new things that I'm gonna share with you today that's new in diabetes for this, for that just sort of was emerged this year. So here we are, Di that's a good, very good segue, diabetes in the news. So what really came out this year is that <coughs> And I don't know if anybody, did anybody hear about this in the media? It was in several papers, like local papers, as well as the you know, scientific journals, that there might be five types of diabetes now, or they might to reclassify it. So currently we understand that there's two main types, and we've heard of type one and type two. Has everybody heard of those two main types of diabetes? So now they're suggesting there perhaps might be five, and this study came out of Sweden and Finland where they studied 15,000 patients and they came up with these five different clusters based on the patient's characteristics like their age and their body type and they looked at the risk of diabetes complications and they came up with possibly five clusters. So I'm going to talk about what the results were but first I think it's worth recalling the two types I just talked about, which we've known for really the, since diabetes was, was discovered as a disease entity as type 1 and type 2. So type 1 are people who don't make any insulin at all, and it generally affects the younger people. And if you recall, it, it used to be called juvenile onset because it affected kids, it usually presented in kids, but now we refer to it as type 1 because you can get it as an adult. The body destroys its own cells that make the insulin in the pancreas, so we refer to that as autoimmune process, right? So their body views, they destroy their own cells, so they make no insulin, which means they need insulin to live, essentially. That's the type 1s. The type 2, we've understood it to be two issues where there's not enough insulin, and the insulin that they do have is just not working properly. And we refer to that as insulin resistance. The body is resistant to the insulin, so it can't do its job. Does that make sense? So type 1, type 2. And if you are type 2 and you have to you eventually be on insulin for treatment, it does not make you a type 1. Okay, that just means you have type 2 requiring insulin therapy. Okay, does that make sense? Oh, uh, Carmen, I thought you were going to ask a question. <laughs> so, without the insulin therapy, the issue I have is that I'm trying to explain it to patients whether or not they might be eligible for the disability to have spread it. I know oh. type 1 is a life sustaining. Type 1 is life-sustaining for sure. Um, is there like a gray area for type 2 as well in terms of with no insulin they have the potential of not being able to survive without it? I think at some point there is. So mm -hmm. that's a actually a good question because type 2, and this is important to understand actually, it's a progressive disease right. so that over time the pancreas eventually poops out and does not have any insulin left to release. So the medications that one is on don't work over time and most people require insulin therapy eventually. So yes, yeah, so 
So, and it's different for everybody in terms of when that is, in terms of living with diabetes. Some people need insulin right away at diagnosis, and some people can be on just diet and then medications for 20 years before insulin um, is needed to help control the blood sugar. So that's a good question. Does that make, did I answer your question? Okay. Yes. Um, talking about insulin, if you are taking insulin now, would it mean that as you go further in your life, the insulin level will increase? From the insulin that you're giving yourself? Yes. Because uh, I know that there are some people who get a lot of insulin. Yes. And, that's, and people who are. On yeah. little. Yeah. So that's a very good question. So there's two components to that. So there's the pancreas that's not pr releasing mm -hmm. enough insulin. So there's a relative insulin deficiency, not enough. Mm -hmm. But the, there's also the insulin resistance part where even if you have a lot of insulin circulating, it's just not able to do its job. So some people, and this is where those clusters come in actually, that's a very good segue. Some people are more resistant than, um, than others. So you can have somebody who's more resistant and have enough insulin, but it's just not doing the job. Or you can have a person who's less resistant, but have not, and not enough insulin. So their issue is more about the pancreas not having enough insulin, and one other person could be more resistant. Does that make sense? So the person who's resistant requires a lot more insulin to control their sugar. Whereas the one who is not resistant but just doesn't have enough insulin probably needs a lot less because whatever you give them is going to work properly. Does that make sense? Whereas another person, if they're resistant and it's just not able to work properly, you can give them like a lot of insulin and only maybe half of what you're giving them is actually able to work and do the job. Does that make sense? Now, yes. Is there a time that you are going to be in a progressive where you might need more. more? It can change over time. You can be on the same dose for a long time, and sometimes there's a lot of factors that affect the needs. So, for example, in kidney disease, because insulin is cleared by the kidney, and I'm talking about insulin that you inject, mm -hmm. if you're kidneys aren't working properly and not able to clear the insulin, you in fact need less insulin to control your sugar because the insulin that you give lasts a lot longer in your body, so you need less. But if you get a transplant, like the patients that I see, and you get a working kidney again, it starts to clear that insulin and you need a lot more insulin after the transplant, and it's a lot, a lot more, to control the blood sugars, because there's, there's two reasons. The kidney's working now, and the medicine for transplant raises the blood sugar. So then you need a lot more insulin to control it. So there's a lot of factors, it's a good question, but I think what you're asking is, is the pancreas over time, right? It doesn't make any enough insulin. So you might need ins a little bit of insulin, but when the, as a pancreas you know, uh, function declines, then you'll need more. Okay, but if, if you gain weight, you will need more. Cause when you have more weight on yourself, on your body, especially around the tummy, you're more resistant to insulin. You're welcome. Okay, so that leads into the five clusters. You actually sort of just described it already. So really what this means is that it's more about the type twos where you can have I, which I already mentioned, somebody who's slim and more um, insulin deficient, or somebody who's more bigger and more insulin resistant. And why this is, is useful for us to know is that we can target the different treatments to certain patient characteristics of these subcategories, I would call them, of these various clusters. And they found also with certain clusters of of people or characteristics that eye disease is more, or they're at risk for eye disease more so. So they found it in the younger people with um, less insulin production 
and moderate insulin resistance to have more eye disease, more risk of eye disease. So if we know that ahead of time, then we can try to target those defects that they have. Because certain medications target more insulin deficiency and more um, some medications target more of the insulin resistance component. So really what this study adds and, and helps us as healthcare professionals is to tailor the treatment to the individual characteristics of the person. And so it's not a one size fits all type of deal. So type two, just because you're in type two doesn't mean you're all the same. So I think that's what this study actually um, tells us that we have to individualize the treatment. And not everybody presents the same and not everybody responds the same to the same treatments. Does that make sense? So it does provide us with some, you know, individuality which is important to, to, to do when we see our patients and not put everybody in the same category. So maybe in the future we'll see five types of diabetes as an actual thing as, instead of saying we've got two types. In fact, we have two sub, uh, you know, four subtypes of type two. So it wasn't really insulin. You don't have diabetes yet. It was just a warning shot. So what are the risk factors? So there is a link to taking a test to see for those who don't have diabetes if you're at risk. So I'm going to show some of the questions. Then you can think in your mind are you at risk? And Teddy was very kind enough to provide us some resources at the back and I think there is one of the tests, um, I think it's actual same questions that I have on the slides on, um, on a paper behind you that you, if, you, if you're interested you could pick up and see if you're at risk. So if you're age 40 or older, you're at risk for type 2 diabetes and should be tested every three years. So in general, general population, we should be screening or you should be seeing your family physician um, from the age 40 onwards, every three years they should check your blood sugar. If you have more than one risk factor, which I'll talk about, then you should probably be tested more often than every three years. So if you have it in your family, that's probably one of the biggest risk factors in your um, first degree relatives, so your parents or your siblings. And then certain ethnic ethnicities are at higher risk uh, as well. So if you have a parent, brother, or sister with diabetes, if you're a member of a high-risk group, so Aboriginal, Hispanic, South Asian, Asian, or African descent, if you have health complications that are associated with diabetes, so this is eye disease, kidney disease, heart disease, any of those complications, puts you at risk for diabetes. If you're a female and you were um, pregnant and you had high blood sugars during that time and that's referred to as gestational diabetes, that's a risk factor. And if you've ever been told you have prediabetes, that's a risk factor, which is either impaired glucose tolerance or impaired fasting glucose. And high blood pressure is a risk factor for type 2 diabetes. And we're talking about type 2 diabetes, by the way. If you're female and you gave birth to a baby that was over 9 pounds, is a risk factor for diabetes. And if you have high cholesterol or other fats in your blood. And then if you're overweight, especially if you carry the weight around the middle, puts you at risk. And then if you have any of the following conditions, and these are all associated with insulin resistance. So polycystic ovarian syndrome for the females. If you've ever been told you have acanthosis nigricans, which is darkened patches of the skin, those are, and they're thick, those are signs of, uh, that's a sign of insulin resistance. And then schizophrenia itself, is a risk factor. So we thought before the medicines that would people would be on for mental health issues, particularly for schizophrenia, those drugs can cause diabetes. But now they're thinking the actual disease of schizophrenia can be a risk factor for diabetes. So if you checked any of the boxes above, you should be tested for diabetes earlier and or more often. So age in and of itself, you should be screened every three years. 
but with any of these other risk factors, you should be screened more often. So it's important to talk a little bit about obesity because it is a, it's a pretty strong risk factor. It causes insulin resistance. About 80 to 90% of people with type 2 diabetes are overweight, and we measure this by checking um, by your height and your weight, which is called the body mass index, or BMI. So anything over 25 is considered overweight. And then if you get over 30, then they categorize it as obesity. And that's just a term that we use in the medical community for being overweight, really. Come again, please. Uh, when you measure it, how do you measure that? So we take your weight and your height, and we punch it, put it in a, I have an app to do this. It's a calculation, and it tells me what your BMI is. Uh, but you need your height and weight to be able to calculate the BMI. But you can find it online, a BMI calculator, and you just plug in your numbers, and then uh, it will tell you what your number is, and then it will give you where you fall in. So generally, 24.9 uh, or less is normal. And then anything over that 25 to 29 is, o is overweight and then 30 and higher is in the obese category. And they kind of categorize it by one, two, and three. So are you an apple or a pear? So being an apple, it's hard to see it, but there's an apple in, on the left there, is when somebody carries their weight around the middle, and the pear shape is really more in the hips. Okay, and is it, why is it significant? So when we look at another way of measuring, we look at the waist-hip ratio. And in this case, we measure your waist and your hips, and that, and that kind of gives us, it tells us if you're an apple or a pear. And when you're an apple, as you can see there, it's more associated with diabetes, as well as high blood pressure or cardiovascular disease. And the waist-hip ratio number if you're a man, over, and if it comes out to over 1.0, that's elevated. And for women, if it's over 0.85, when you do the calculation, again, I have an app for that, it describes you as an apple shape, which is a risk factor for diabetes. So we need your waist and hip measurement to get that calculation. So has had anybody had their waist or hip measured? in your doctor's office? Because we grow older, it it's so hard to get us below one or <laughs> Yeah, mm-hmm. It's so hard. It so is, hard. it is. Because even if we don't eat, our body grows big, I don't know why. You know, our metabolism slows down naturally as we ol get older, and that's one of the issues that happens. And that's one of the challenges, I should say, really. And for even, I mean, women in, are fighting hormones when you're getting into menopause and that um, in and of itself can be challenging for women for weight and weight gain. So can type 2 diabetes be <coughs> prevented? I already alluded to this earlier and you know scientists believe there are studies um, that show that lifestyle modification which includes activity and the food that you're eating, he um, healthy eating and weight loss can prevent or delay type 2 diabetes. For me, I feel, I feel that if you have a predisposition um, and you have prediabetes, then you're, delay, you, you're at high risk for type 2 diabetes. It's more of a delay, um, but, they, but you can also prevent it where you can just stay normal you know, and never develop it. But I feel like if you have a predisposition, then you, have, you can certainly delay the development of type 2 diabetes. So some tips for taking control and trying to prevent this from developing. One of the main messages for this year, we had guidelines published by Diabetes Canada that helps healthcare professionals to care for people with diabetes. And one of the main messages for the activity section was that to sit less, get moving, and be fit. And what does that mean, really? It's to reduce sedentary time. 
And the suggestion, and I think this is more realistic for people, if you hear it from us saying, you know, instead of me saying you should be exercising 150 minutes per week, that is the recommendation, which is, you know, 30 minutes, five days a week. Like who can do that realistically? And you need the motivation. So we've sort of, now they've shown that sitting less or reducing your sedentary time. Every 30 minutes, actually, you should be getting up for two minutes. So have we been sitting for 30 minutes? I think we should all get up just to get up. And that, that in and of itself helps, right? Get up and move around <laughs> for two minutes um, makes a difference than if you were to sit continuously and not get up if you were set. So being sedentary in front of your computer at your workplace or in front of the TV. So the suggestion now is to get up every 20 to 30 minutes makes a difference. And so doing so promotes weight loss, lowers your blood sugar, boosts your sensitivity to insulin. So it's not about, you know, running a marathon. It's about reducing your sedentary time. And really what that means is not sitting for more than 30 minutes at a time, getting up for two minutes, even if you're just standing. So the conference I went to, the Diabetes Canada conference recently, they had for the first time, you know, they have rows of chairs because you're sitting for a lecture, but at the back they had these stand-up tables so that you could stand at. So you get up, you move, you go to the table, you stand, and then you go back to sit down. So again, they're doing that, again, to show sitting less and getting moving is better than sitting all the time. Okay? So that's one of the main messages this year from the guidelines regarding activity. So, I mean, the real guidelines, not the real guidelines, but the, the eventuality is that you want to aim for 30 minutes three to five days a week. So to me, to get people motivated and to try to be active, just presenting it as reduce your sedentary time is probably more realistic than starting off with aiming for 30 minutes, three to five days a week. And these are just examples of types of activities that are beneficial to you. So it's the aerobic exercises. So even chores around the house is considered aerobic activity. So you, again, you don't need to join a gym raking your leaves like this is the best time of year is good exercise right getting the leaves um, in a pile putting them in a bag that in and of itself is helpful and walking is the other um, activity that's really easy to do and most people can do and if you have joint issues being in the water is the best thing even if you're just walking in the water resistance exercises really has to do with the you know um, moving your muscles and using the bands, I think, um, are what's recommended. And people are, easily can do that at home as opposed to weight lifting. But the bands are, are just as effective. So f in terms of diet, so, you know, uh, you know, in the context of kidney disease, right, you're going to adjust what you're able to have. But generally, for health, you want to get plenty of fiber. That helps with cholesterol and lowers your risk for heart disease. It does help improve blood sugar. And it can promote weight loss. How? Because it makes you feel full. So it's the type of fiber that you have that's effective and can be if, uh, helpful in those situations. So here's our examples of what are high in fiber compared to what's low in fiber. So I know in certain levels of kidney disease, you can't really have the whole wheat bread, right? Um, but those are the choices for the higher fiber uh, compared to the low fiber. And those are just examples. So people with diabetes in general should have 25 to 50 grams of fiber per day. And that's similar to the general population, but they actually need a little bit more, and that's more for the blood sugar control. You want to go for whole grains. So you want to make half of your grains whole grains. And you want to look for the word whole on the packaging. Um, when you're looking at the ingredients, it should be one of the first few items on the ingredient list. So
So here are just examples what you want to choose more often as opposed to less often. So parboiled rice as opposed to um, minute rice, for example, is, has more grains in it, whole grains. So foods that turn into sugar slowly are, eas are easier for your body to handle and can reduce the risk of diabetes. So certain foods that contain carbohydrates um, are slower at, rate, or at uh, turning into sugar, and those are the ones that you want to have as opposed to ones that are faster to help reduce your risk for diabetes. The GMOs are not being uh, considered in these studies yet, the effect of the GMOs. Right, the genetically modified mm -hmm. items. How come they haven't been considered? In, I mean, I understand the effects of, can be pretty serious. Mm hmm. I'm not, I'm not actually 100% sure about that. That's a very, really good question. I would defer to my dietitian colleagues who are not in the room right now. We only have two nurses. Um, but Carol, who's the dietitian in the program, mm -hmm. we can put that question to her about the GMOs. But yeah, I'm not 100% on that, why it's not considered in, in the whole, you know, recommendations. Mm -hmm. So strike a healthy balance. We have, has everybody seen the space on your plate idea? That resource is at the back too. So really you wanna make half your plate vegetables. And this is just an easy way of, for, for a visual. Um, a quarter of your plate should be starch and then a quarter of protein. And there's the handy portion guide that's also helpful. Um, I don't think I have a slide of it, but it's in the back where for the different food groups, you know, just to get the measurement of what you should have, um, just by the hand. So, portion like a from protein, it's the palm of your hand, for example. Um, that's the suggested serving. So you can have those tools if you're not unsure of, you know, in terms of trying to be more healthy in terms of portion sizes. There's a handy tool at the back there, and it has to do with your hands, so that it's easy to to remember as opposed to measuring things out and weighing it, because that's a little more intense. And the space in your plate, same idea. So tip number four is keep your weight in check. So, you know, losing weight is, is not an easy thing to do. Um, however, when one does lose weight, it does improve your health. Um, five to 10% of the body weight is what we try to, and it's more realistic for patients to understand and um, target to help uh, reduce their overall health risk. And it can be by 60% over three years um, in terms of developing diabetes. So this was shown in the studies, and that's with both exercise as well as um, healthy eating. The waist circumference I already spoke about, but the actual measurement, um, if we want to not be such an apple, is for the men's waist to target uh, 40 inches or less, and for women it's 35 inches or less, and that's considered in the healthier range. So over that would be getting into the apple shape. So know your target blood sugar range, um, I alluded to this a little bit, so for somebody with diabetes already, this is sort of the ranges that we aim for. So before you start eating, your, eight, your target is between four and seven, and after eating up to 10. And that's, with, if that's uh, in somebody with diabetes. When we keep in those ranges, it reduces your risk for complications. Okay, and that keeps all your organs healthy. So four to 10 is basically the number that we want to aim for. And we know that when you eat, your blood sugar will go up. We just, by two hours, it should start to come down and it shouldn't be higher than 10. And that's really what this little diagram here is illustrating. Oh, I didn't know I had these animations. 
So why is it important to keep our blood sugars under good control in the setting of diabetes? And I already alluded to that. It reduces your risk for complications. So we know this. We had studies done in the 90s that demonstrated getting your blood sugars down will reduce your risk for complications. And that's where the numbers came from. And we're still going by those studies because and they're considered landmark studies. It prevents symptoms. It makes you feel much better when your sugars are in these ranges and it improves your overall health. When you're high, you don't feel so well. And some people just accommodate and could go around with high blood sugars all the time and feel fine and don't realize how unwell they are until their blood sugars are brought down. So what are the complications that are associated? So there, um, our blood vessels in the body is what's affected. So we have large blood vessels. We have blood vessels to the heart. So the heart, one of the main reasons why pe people with diabetes die is because of a heart of their heart. 40% of heart attacks are attributed from diabetes. 30% of strokes are from diabetes and it is still one of the leading causes of end-stage renal disease. So 50% of kidney failure requiring dialysis is because of diabetes. 70% of all non-traumatic leg and foot amputations are related to diabetes. And it is the leading cause of blindness in working age adults. So it's an unfortunate thing that this hasn't really changed, that the complications still occur. Um, but we know getting the blood sugars down to a certain range will help reduce that risk. Question. Yes. If somebody is diagnosed with diabetes, is there a chance it will be reversed because of change in lifestyle? That's a good question. So the thing is this, you can get your blood sugars down close to normal but you have to work at it. It doesn't mean the diabetes has gone away because if you go back to previous habits and the blood sugars will go up. So does that make sense? So you can get your blood sugars down, but you have to st stick to you know, being healthy, right? Yeah. Can the medications be withdrawn? In some cases it can, definitely. Sometimes you need less if you've made if you've lost weight, you made significant changes in, in your lifestyle, you can come off your medicines or reduce, if you're on insulin, you can reduce your insulin um, amounts for sure. Mm -hmm. It does make a difference. And, and an example of that is people who have bariatric surgery, who lose hundreds of pounds, actually, in, that's probably the only case where they might reverse diabetes where they become normal and they can eat whatever they want. What that kind of surgery is it? Bariatric surgery. So examples of bariatric surgery is when they bypass the stomach. So essentially you end up with a little teeny tiny stomach. And that's what helps them lose weight. Or you can band the stomach to make it smaller. You see that on TV. Yes. So it reverses a lot of things. It can make your cholesterol, you can come off your cholesterol medicines, your blood pressure medicines, and your diabetes medicines. And the other condition that can reverse diabetes is if you get a pancreas transplant. That's the other thing, because then you've got insulin being produced and it's as if you didn't have diabetes. So that's, those are actually the two examples. But other than that, no, it doesn't really go away. Because the pancreas will, will eventually fail as well. It doesn't, last, you know, it doesn't last forever when you have a transplant. So how do I keep my blood sugars under good control? I've already talked a little bit about this already with the healthy eating and the exercise and the weight loss. Stress, we can't forget about, can affect blood sugars. So dealing with you know, any forms of stress and accessing your health, you know, your team to help you do that will help your blood sugar control. And then taking medications. And then monitoring your blood sugar is another um, tool that helps you to control your blood sugars better. And you can access the 
monitors through a diabetes team. So there's no cost to you, the machines we give you. Um, and then you get a prescription for the test strips, which most plans cover, either private, and if you're on Trillium or on Ontario Drug Benefits, the test strips are covered. And so, so it shouldn't be a, a cost, shouldn't be a barrier. Yes? Um, I heard that there is a light, what do you call it? The test strip that you did. Oh, the Libra. Oh, you're you know, good. Yeah, yeah, okay, so that's actually the, I'm going to talk about the newest technology that is upcoming. It's, you guys are way ahead of me. <laughs> yes, I'll be talking about that. That is the newest technology available. All right. I already talked about reducing sedentary time, and this is just my couch potato <laughs> with the TVs, being at your computer or sitting in your car. I already talked about reducing sedentary time. Just examples of what that looks like. Again, every 30 minutes getting up. So I've already talked about that. The good news for type 2 diabetes, and I again alluded to this, is keeping your blood sugars down reduces the complications significantly. And there's a test that we do called A1C. Has anybody heard of this test? Has any of your doctors or nurses talked to you about it? Yes. That, that, right. So it's, an, uh, it's a uh, reflection of your average blood sugar over a three month period. And we use that number to assess basically the blood sugar control. And this is the number that we look to to get down and the num magic number is seven and we know that it reduces heart attacks by 16%, eye damage by 21, and kidney disease by 34%. Getting that A1C down to seven, and it's reported in percentage, that's 7%, which is about an average blood sugar of around eight. Okay, so when you get your sugars around eight, you know your A1C will be around 7%, keeps your organs healthy. So what's new for the treatment of type 2 diabetes? I'm going to share with you just a few things that's come down more recently in the last couple of years actually. Um, and without getting um, you know, into the medical jargon, I'll try to explain it as simply as possible. And you might have heard of some of these treatments if you have diabetes. And if you have kidney disease, you know, certain medications are not um, have to be used with caution or at reduced doses. And once the kidneys are at a certain level, then you can't be on these medicines because just because they're involved, the kidneys involved in metabolizing them. And if they build up in the blood, that's not a good thing. So there's three main things that have come out in the last couple of years. And there's one that's called, um, we refer to them as GLP-1 and it's to keep it simple, it's a hormone that we already have in our body, and it's a gut hormone. It does a lot of good things for us, but in somebody with diabetes, they don't either have enough, pretty much that's what the issue is, um, and you need to replace it to be able to function properly. So what it does is it actually stimulates the pancreas to release insulin, it makes your body more receptive to insulin, and it makes you feel full. So tells your brain you're full so you eat less and you actually weight, lose weight with this drug. And when they were studying this drug for diabetes, they found that it also, because you lose weight, they studied it for weight loss. And now they have the drug that's for diabetes and they have a higher dose of the same drug for weight loss. So, and it's only an injectable form. So interestingly, when we present this to patients, when we say, you know, you might need insulin, and a lot of people are afraid of insulin injections, so they don't want to start. But if you tell them about this drug and say you'll lose weight, they'll try it. It's very interesting. So, you know, it, it's, if you think about it, the injection itself is a fear for sure. It's not the insulin, it's the injection, but if there's a incentive like weight loss, then they're willing to try it. So that drug is available and it's, um, it can be a weekly injectable and it lowers your blood sugar and it also protects the heart. 
So there are certain levels of kidney decline where we would can give it to you, but at certain times then we can't, you know, as the, as the kidney function declines. There's also um, new insulins that's come out that last a long time in the body. So they're 30 to 42 hours now. The ones prior to this would last 24 hours. So now we've got ones lasting a long time. Um, and then the main advantage of these insulins is that it causes less low blood sugar or hypoglycemia. So that's the main advantage for, advantage for patients who are on insulin to be on this kind of length of insulin. Again, we have to use it with caution in patients with kidney disease. So insulin is fine for people with kidney disease, but as I mentioned that when the kidneys start to fail, it doesn't clear that insulin as well, so it lasts a long time. So you don't want to have something that's already lasting a long time, lasting even longer, because it could last you know, a long, long time and then might put you at risk for low sugar in that situation. So again, it's individual to the person. And the last one, which is the most exciting one, I think, is called an SGLT2 inhibitor, which works on the kidney, and it makes you pee the sugar out. It actually makes you pee the sugar out, so that normally 90% of the sugar is absorbed in the kidney, goes back into the bloodstream. This drug blocks that action and actually makes you pee it out, and so that you lose calories during, because sugar goes out in your pee, and you actually lose weight with this drug. So it has a lot of other benefits in addition to controlling sugar, and it was also found to protect the heart and the kidney. So all drugs that are now being proposed for diabetes have to go through heart safety trials, okay? They have to make sure that they're not gonna kill people. So what they find, what you want is that their drugs are neutral, that they're not harmful to somebody's heart. These drugs came out superior, meaning they actually benefit the heart. They protect your heart and they also found that it protects your kidneys. So not only does it help with blood sugar, it helps to protect your heart and your kidneys. So these drugs are second line recommendations, and especially if you already have existing heart disease. So if you have kidney disease, so stage three or higher, it's okay to be on this drug, but below that, um, we can't give it to you. Uh, yes? Quick question, what do you mean by stage three or higher? It's also safe for stage four and five? Ah, very good question. I meant, actually that should say stage three or? Lower. Lower, <laughs> yes, you're right. You so no, stage four or five is worsening kidney function, so that's not the case, you're right. So stage one, stage two, stage three are fine. Yes? And you cannot take that if you are at that stage. The lower, the higher stages of stage four and five, it's not for you. Because your not, are not left functioning. There's really no benefit, yeah, for, for it at the lower stages, for sure. Um, and the guidelines actually shifted. It used to say 45, like your GFR 45, um, but now they've lowered to 30, because for the heart benefit. It's not, there's no benefit when it's low for the blood sugar, but it's benefit for the heart, and it's still safe at that level. So in other words, if the EGFR rate is lower than 30, then that is not a drug? That is not a drug for you. Okay. We won't, yeah, it's not effective. There's no, no um, yeah, it wouldn't be effective in, in lowering sugar. Okay, so the last thing I wanna review, and it's already been brought up, is what is the newest diabetes technology and that has to do with monitoring your blood sugar. And it's called the Freestyle Libra. And why is this exciting? It's because it doesn't require any finger pricks or lancets or needles. It's referred to as a flash glucose monitoring system that uses sensors. And somebody tried it here, right? And how did you find it? Actually, yes, there is a needle, but I don't Oh, you're just, right. Don't just <laughs> When you put it on your arm, yes. it's a little bit of a pain, but if you don't know, there's no pain if you don't think about it. You're right. I forgot about that part. So the thing is, the sensor, see this little guy here? 
you actually have to attach it to your body. <laughs> so there is a there is a little needle on the end of the sensor that actually punctures your skin because that's how it's measuring the blood. It's actually the interstitial fluid, actually. It's not the blood itself, it's the interstitial fluid. So it's, um, it's like an auto injector. So you, you put it on your arm and then you just push down on it and then it attaches to your, <laughs> to your arm. So that could hurt for a second. I tried it myself, I didn't actually feel pain. Um, and that would be the only time. And this lasts for 14 days. It's good for 14 days, this sensor. And you can swipe it as many times as you want to get your blood sugar. Imagine. It's not the same as if, you know, people will test the minimum times because you have to poke your finger every time, which is, can be painful. Even though they've designed the needles so fine for people, it's still painful for people. People have different sensitivities. So it measures it automatically and it, and it continuously stores the reading. So um, here, that's what the sensor looks like. So can you see the little, needle. the needle part there? It's actually, um, uh, the needle is just for the initial puncture, but what's left in there is plastic. It's not a needle. So it's plastic, like a catheter, like a little, you know, when you have an IV put in, they need a needle to thread it first and then they pull it out, but they leave the little plastic catheter in. So that's, that's what it's left in your, in, your, um, in your tissue. It's water resistant, so you can shower with it. You could swim if you wanted to or go on, um, you know, it can get wet. It could also scan through your clothing. So even, I tried it on my jacket with a jacket on. So you have several layers of clothing, you can still swipe and it'll scan it. Um, it is dis fairly discreet because you're going to put it at the back of your arm, 35 by 5. Does that make sense? 35 millimeters? I don't know if that's right. Uh, and I mentioned last, last 14 days. The only issue with this is that, oh, I'll talk to you about the next slide. So this is kind of how it looks. This is the, um, <clears throat> the device that comes with it. I can't, the name of this is escaping me what we actually call this reader, it's the reader, um, and it tells you, it can actually sense if your blood sugar is on the rise or if it's, on, if it's trend, trending downward. So it kind of gives you a heads up at the direction of where it's going. And it gives you the data for the last eight hours. So it tells you a lot of information. And you can just carry this around with you and you just swipe it whenever you want. So there are situations, though, I should mention when you would want to test your uh, sort of, sort of uh, um, collaborate it with your uh, finger prick. And it's when you have rapidly changing blood sugar levels, particularly if it's going down fast. Or if your symptoms don't match what the reading is, then you might want to check it against a finger prick. But you don't have to calibrate it ever with finger prick. You actually does not need to be calibrated, whereas other systems need to be calibrated and you still have to use finger pricks. So I don't know if you've heard of the continuous blood glucose monitoring, which is a similar thing that's put under the skin and it's attached, but you have to, it's a different system, uh, calibrate it with a finger prick. So the only thing with the, the Freestyle Libra at this time is it costs, oh, you need to get up. Over my foot. Oh no! <laughs> um, Sorry. No worries. It's not covered yet. It's because anything that comes out new um, takes time to obtain coverage for. So there's no coverage under Ontario Drug Benefits or Trillium. So the starter kit is around two hundred twenty-seven dollars, which includes the reader, which is forty-nine dollars, and then the sensor is eighty-nine. But it's actually, you know, when if you think about the cost factor for the sensor, it's cheaper than the test strips because the test strips are roughly a dollar each still. That has not changed in like to 25 years that I've been in practice. They're still about a dollar each. Um, but the sensor, because you can test multiple times, is, is actually more cost effective than an actual test strip. So right now it's costly for, you know, if you don't have third party coverage. 
um, to obtain a Freestyle Libra. But that is the newest in technology. But yes? You only have to buy the starter kit and the reader one time. That's correct. And the sensor is every two weeks. That's, That's right. That's correct. And they usually, I think you can buy the sensor in a two package. Um, they come in a package of two. That's right. So the reader you keep forever. Yeah. Did you want to have a question? No, I, you answered. Ah, okay, yes, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, in terms of that, uh, will, will our uh, drug plan? Uh, I think if you have third party coverage, they are probably covering it. But otherwise, it's not covered yet under Ontario Drug Benefits or Disability or Trillium. So do you need prescription for this? I think if you want to get coverage, like for your third party coverage, yeah. Like for any meter, you should have <coughs> prescription for the test strips and the equipment. So yeah, yes. So I just want to end, but you know, there is good news about diabetes, not all bad and complications, yes. Regarding the uh, data, is it stored? Can you send the data? Is, oh. is it a transfer or transfer? Yeah, you know what? That's a good question. Um, I know most meters you can, if you have a computer, you can download to the computer and it, yeah. And that one test will uh, actually gather all your data, even several months, that you, you can see the graph. You can chart the it. Yeah, yeah. and nice. usually they have graphs in different ways. Yeah like pi or regular graphs for sure. Mm -hmm. So I want to end with that there is good news about diabetes and not all bad about diabetes and having diabetes. Um, and really you can stay healthy by you know keeping your blood sugars down and, I, and that's not an easy thing to say. It's easy for me to say, I should say not easy to do. Um, but we're here to help you and support you. Uh, and, and your family members, learning self, the self-care skills, which is really the main thing, because it really has to do with the person living with it. Um, but really having you access the resources that's available to you to help you do the best you can, and, you know, and following the advice of your healthcare professionals regarding medications, for example. And then if you don't have diabetes, you know, knowing um, if you're at risk and trying to be more proactive about your health and <coughs> learning to, you know, strategies to prevent type 2 diabetes so that you know the numbers that we saw on that map initial map that I showed you don't keep going up right so you know for the generations to come this is kind of what we hope that we have those numbers going down as opposed to up so and is that just you know focusing on you and this is your diabetes care team which really is a lot of people um, are here to help you and support you but really, you are the center of it all. Yes. Question. I'm sorry if I missed this part. Is yes. type 2 diabetes mostly genetic or acquired? So it's a, it does tend to run in families, for sure. Um, I think that's one of the main risk factors, that, it's, that it tends to run in families, yes. Yeah, as opposed to type 1, there's a small, small you know, risk of, of if it's in your father, it's a, it's a little bit of higher risk, like 6% risk of the offspring getting type 1 diabetes. But it's if you have two parents, for example, with type 2 diabetes, it's high. It's like over 50% risk of, of yourself getting it if your parents have it. Yeah. And eth ethnicity is also a big one. It tends to run in, you know, in, the, in groups for sure. Well, thank you for listening. And uh, we have to say thank you thank for presenting oh, oh, you're welcome. You're very welcome. My pleasure. <laughs>